measured by its results, the most priceless legacy of medieval times to mankind was the university system, which began in crude form and with an almost mythical origin, but which gradually took form and shape in consequence of many external forces. Universitas in the original Latin meant simply a collection, a plurality or an aggregation. It was almost synonymous with collegium. By the beginning of the 13th century, it was applied to corporations of masters or students and to other associated bodies and implied an association of individuals, not a place of meeting, nor even a collection of schools. The three great schools of the 13th century were Paris, transcendent in theology and the arts, Bologna, where legal law prevailed, and Salerno, where existed the greatest medical school of the world's history. In spite of the fact that these, like all the other schools of the Middle Ages, were under the influence of the church from them, sprang most of the inspiration that constituted the mainspring of medieval intellectual activity. Although how baneful such influence could be may be illustrated by the Spanish. That is the ultra-Catholic University of Salamanca, where not until the 18th century were they allowed to teach the Copernican system of astronomy. In those days, boys were accustomed to seek the university at the ages of 13 to 15. A Paris statute required them to be at least 14, and naturally, many were older. Many of these students were clerical, and boys were canons or even rectors of parish churches. In this capacity, they obtained leave of absence to study in the universities, and so it was quite common at one time for rectors and ecclesiastics of all ages to appear in the role of university students. At the close of the 14th century, in the University of Prague, in the law school alone there appeared on the list of students one bishop, one abbot, nine archdeacons, 290 canons, 187 rectors, and still other minor ecclesiastics. When it came to the matter of discipline, the good old-fashioned birch rod was not an unknown factor in university government. There seems to have been always a certain relationship between classic studies and corporal punishment. In medieval university records, allusions to this relationship began about the 15th century. In Paris, about this time, when there were so many disgraceful factional fights, the rectors and proctors had occasionally to go to the colleges and halls and personally superintend the chastisement of the young rioters. We find also in the history of the University of Louvain that flogging was at one time ordered by the Faculty of Arts for homicide or other grave outrages. It is worthwhile to recall for a moment how grave offences were dealt with in those days. At the University of Ingolstadt, one student killed another in a drunken quarrel and was punished by the university by the confiscation of their scholastic effects and garments, but he was not even expelled. In Leipzig in 1439, the fine of ten groschen was provided for the offence of lifting a stone or missile with a view of throwing it at a master, but not actually throwing it, whereas the act of throwing and missing increased the penalty to eight florins, while successful marksmanship was still more expensive. Later statutes made distinction between hitting without wounding and wounding without mutilation, expulsion being the penalty for actual mutilation. With the beginning of the 16th century, the practice of flogging the very poorest students appears to have been introduced. During these Middle Ages, they had a peculiar fashion of expiating even grave offences. For example, at the Sorbonne, if a fellow should assault or cruelly beat a servant, he was fined a measure of good wine, not for the benefit of the servant, but for all the culprit's fellow students. Gradually, supplementary lectures were introduced, but there was a period during which the university seemed to decline and decay rather than the reverse, when intellectual life was not nearly as active and studies not nearly as closely pursued. In the days of Thomas Aquinas, intellectual vigor was at its highest, but in the 15th century there was a distinct falling off. In those days, lectures began at six in the morning in summer and sometimes as late as seven in the winter mornings. There is every reason to think that often lectures were given in the darkness preceding dawn, and even without artificial light. It should be said that these lectures were sometimes three hours in duration, and hence it might appear that three such lectures a day were about all that could be expected of a student. The standard of living for the medieval student was not always so bad as has been sometimes represented. University students then, as now, were recruited from the highest as well as the poorest social classes, 
and the young sons of princely families often had about them quite an establishment. At the lower end of the university social ladder was the poor scholar who was reduced to begging for their living or becoming a servant in one of the colleges. In Vienna and elsewhere, there were halls whose inmates were regularly sent out to beg, the proceeds being placed in a common chest. Very poor scholars were often granted licenses to beg by the chancellor. This was not regarded as a particular degradation, however, because the example of the friars had made begging comparatively respectable. Those who would have been ashamed to work hard were not ashamed to beg. The winter in the northern university towns must have been severe, but it is not likely that either in the lecture room or in their own apartments did the student have any comfort from heat. This was true to such an extent that they often sought the kitchens for comfort. In Germany, it was even one of the duties of the head of the college to inspect the college rooms, lest the occupants should have supplied themselves with some source of heat. In some places, however, there was a common hall or combination room in which a fire was built in cold weather. In 1600, the rooms inhabited by some of the junior fellows at Cambridge were still unprovided with glass windows. Add to these hardships the relative expense of lights, when the average price of candles was nearly two pence per pound, which meant the poorest student could not afford to study by artificial light. Along with these hardships, consider the amusements of this period, which were for the greater part conspicuous by their absence. Statutes concerning amusements were often more stringent than those concerning crime or vice. Even playing with a ball or bat was at times forbidden, along with other insolent games. A statute of the 16th century speaks of tennis as among indecent games, whose introduction would create scandal in and against the college. Dancing was rather a favorite amusement, but was repressed as far as possible since the celebrated William of Wykeham found it necessary to prohibit dancing and jumping in the chapel. Apparently then, in those days, a good student amused himself little, if at all, and had to find their relaxation in the frequent interruptions caused by church holidays. At St. Andrews in Scotland, however, two days holiday was allowed at carnival time expressly for cockfighting. 